Hi, I'm Jesse, lead pastor for Two Rivers Bible Church. Welcome to today's online worship experience. You might be at home, circled around with your children, or you might be at work, you're just taking a break so you can uh, connect and dial in to today's uh, message. Wherever you might be, I just want to affirm to you that Jesus is there with you as he is here with me. That God is with us. Any Anytime that we gather together, even if it's through social media, God is there with you, with me, with us. He is present. And so, so there's a unique sense right now in which, like Jesus, like think about it for just a moment, Jesus is right here with us, present. And, and, I, and I just give God just glory, uh, and all the glory and praise uh, that we can give him because of that. Now, today is a very special Sunday. It's Palm Sunday. Now, Palm Sunday is, is, the, is that Sunday where we celebrate the, the entry of Jesus to Jerusalem. As he's headed to the crucifixion, uh, he enters on a donkey, and people have these palm branches, and they're putting these palm branches right in front of Jesus. Uh, they're putting it right on the ground as the donkey passes through, symbolic of, like, this is the king coming in. And the donkey symbolizes that he's coming in, in, in peace. And there's this adoration from the fans, adoration from the crowd saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Savior, oh, save us. But the story that's untold during that time is the story of uncertainty. You see, the crowd, they don't know quite exactly what they're expecting. Some of them are expecting the reigning king. If Jesus is the king, he's going to reign from Jerusalem, and he's going to usurp the powers of the Roman Empire. And so there's this expectation. There's uncertainty. Is this the king, the long-awaited king that finally has been prophesied and now has come for the disciples? They're also at a state of the uncertainty. They're uncertain. They're not quite sure who this Jesus is. They've seen some of the miracles. They don't know that in a see God or not. They kind of suspect at this point. They don't know the, the enigmatic uh, comments he's made like, you know, tear this temple down. It's going to raise up in the third day. They think he means that he's going to die and resurrect, but they're not quite sure. There's a lot of uncertainty. They're walking in in the most busiest week of Jerusalem. The day of Passover is coming, and so there's a lot of uncertainty. There's even uncertainty in the heart of Jesus, as is demonstrated when he's in the garden, and he's, he's appealing to God, like, God, will you take this away from me? He knows that that the, the wrath of God is going to ensue on him at the cross. And so he's like, will you take that away? And then he says, but not my will, but your will. So there, in that moment, there's a level of uncertainty in Jesus because he knows what's coming to him in terms of the, the isolation from God the Father to the punishment that he's going to receive on our behalf. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty in our culture, too. There's a lot of uncertainty in your lives, maybe even right now. There's the uncertainty of whether you're going to keep the job or not, or the uncertainty of now that you've lost a job, are you going to be able to get another job? The uncertainty of, am I going to get a paycheck or not? Am I going to be able to find a job after all this is said and done? Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, especially with the COVID-19 going on right now. And so uh, and during these uncertain times, this is what I tend to see. This is what we tends to happen during times like this. The the one thing that is common when there's uncertainty is depression. It invades our life. It busts through the door of our heart, and it, and it comes in uninvited and just disturbs our life. And for some of you, that's where you're at right now. You're at a place where it's dark. For some of you, you feel the, just the the, the burden of your soul because you feel this weight, immense weight in your life. And today I want to speak into that so that you can be freed from that and begin to worship God as you should as we head out to Easter next week. I want you to be at a place where you can actually celebrate. Now uncertainty is fine if it leads you to find out uncertainty if, if, if it leads you to a place where you find out find some clarity where you research figure out what is the truth is fine but uncertainty can be fatal if it leaves you in, in limbo and, and and that's where many of us are collectively as a culture as, as as a community as a state as a country 
And so this morning, I want to talk about the anatomy of depression. What are some of the things that get us into that place? What are the paths? The paths that get us to depression. And then I want to remind you with four basic truths. And we're going to use one passage. So go to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. If you've got your Bible, just go ahead and grab it. Open it up. If you have your, your electronic Bible, just go ahead and grab it. Uh, and scroll. Go to the table of contents and scroll to 1 Kings chapter 19 verse one. It's one of my favorite stories. As a matter of fact, I've used this story so many times in our church that those who are part of uh, the church that come here on site, uh, you know, it's, it, they know this story already. But I, but I really felt like we needed to hear it once again. So go there with me. It's, uh, it's about Elijah and Elijah's struggle with depression. In verse 1 it says, When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Now, uh, Ahab is the king at this time. His wife Jezebel is very controlling. She controls her husband through nurturing, right? Her nurture leads to control, and Ahab is a very passive husband. And, and, and Elijah has just had a confrontation with the prophets of different gods that Jezebel, the queen Jezebel, had. And he confronted those prophets, and, and God uh, was put to the test, and God consumed fire. He consumed the offerings where the other gods did not. And so in, in so doing, God showed that he was greater than, that he is the supreme God, that there's nobody like him. And that's what he has shown. And then on top of that, uh, Elijah sees that God just brings fire on, what was it, seven or a thousand prophets, right, of, of, of different gods. And, and now the queen hears about her dearest prophets, the ones that she loves, that, that are uh, pursuing different gods. She hears what happens to them. And this is her response. This is her response, you know. She had heard that he had, what he had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. Not God's prophets, but Baal. God, little G, right? Not a real God, but little G. Verse 2 says, so Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. This is going to be a powerful message. It says, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And with those words, it just puts Elijah into a tailspin. It says Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He gets scared and he runs. He says, I'm not, I'm not staying for this. You know, this is the queen saying, hey, listen. If by this time tomorrow you're not dead, may I be dead. This is like the cold pinky swear kind of deal. And so... That this sense shudder, it shudders into the bones of Elijah and he begins to run. And the irony is, is that he had just seen God demonstrate his powerful power on the prophets and he is scared of this queen. I, I ever encounter people that you just, did they just scare you? And you're like, oh, I don't want to deal with them. I just rather go somewhere else. And this is the sense, you know, that, that Elijah's getting here. So uh, what do you do? What's the path that leads to depression? Well, let's figure out. Verse 3 says, He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Ever been there? Ever been at a point where you just felt like, Lord, I, f I feel so overwhelmed. Why don't, you, why don't you just take my life? Ever felt so depressed that you started envisioning in your head how you would take your life? Ever been so depressed that you start envisioning like, what if I just steer into a tree? Ever been in, in that point in your life where you're like, if I die, would anybody even care? Ever been in that, in that point? That's where Elijah is at. Now, some of you may not be at that point, but you may be at the point of, 
just despair and, and, and feel the weight of your depression and you don't know how to get out of it. You don't know how to get out of it. Or here's, here's how uh, one gets into that place. You know, the path that leads to depression, it's when you wear yourself out. When you wear yourself out. Notice in verse 3 it says, He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. So here he is. He goes 80 miles into this town, right? And now, 80 miles uh, by foot, uh, average person would probably walk it in about 24 to 27 uh, hours, right? In addition to those 80 miles, he goes 80 miles into the wilderness. So 160 miles total. That's, that's a, a walk of uh, two days and a half. And by the end of this, he is worn out. He is exhausted, how many of you are worn out? You've been on the go, do this, do that, do this, do that, complete this task. Now that I'm home, i got to do all these projects, i got to do this, that, and the other, and we're so busy doing all these things, and you're worn out. So listen, if you're worn out, you're on the path towards depression. You're, the, you're on that path, just like Elijah was on that path. And it's this mindset that says, well, I, I got to do this and that. I, I, it, I'm got, got to be the one that does it. And the process, you and I, when we do that, we wear ourselves out. Here's the second path that leads to depression, and that is when you shut people out. And that's exactly what Elijah did. He says he left his servant there, and then he went, say it with me, what? Alone. Now, I know you're listening, so say it with me again there in your family. He went what? Alone. He went alone. Now, I, I want you to look at your neighbor, your, you know, your family member. I want you to tell your family member, you're not alone. You're not alone. Now, I want you to, just so that I know that you're listening, will you tell me, like, Jesse, you're not alone. Thank you. Yes, we're not alone. You're not alone. I'm not alone. Gr- Crisis is there with us, but yet, nevertheless, here Elijah feels like he's alone. He shuts people out, and he, and he leaves by himself. And, and it's the interesting thing is that we tend to do that often, don't we? That when we feel so overwhelmed, when we feel those feelings of, man, I just feel depressed, I feel gloomy, we have the natural tendency to push people out instead of uh, reeling people in. We tend to push people out of our inner circle instead of calling people who know Jesus to come back into our circle. And we have that natural tendency of doing that. Instead of calling the people of God to come and join us, we just shun away from the people of God. And we start saying things like, nobody cares. Nobody listens. Nobody really understands. We start giving ourselves this pity party when in reality, people do care and people do listen. Here's another path that leads us to depression, and that is when we focus, you focus on the negative, when you focus on the negative. We saw that with Elijah in verse 4. It says, for I am no better than my ancestors. It's interesting. Nobody even asked him. Nobody asked him, hey, Elijah, are you better than your ancestors? Nobody asked him. But yet he goes right there into that mindset. He says, I'm no better than my ancestors. And the thing is, is that we're prone to exaggeration. We're prone to look at the negative instead of the positive. We're built to go negative instead of positive. That's why there's so many commands and there's so many challenges in Scripture where it says, hey, look at what's ahead. Fixate your eyes on Christ. Look at what is noble, what is good. It's because we have this natural tendency of looking at what is bad and we get consumed by it. And when we start getting consumed by the negative, we start exaggerating and we start comparing ourselves with other people. We started looking at other people and said, well, they're not struggling. Well, well, he kept his job. Well, he kept uh, the hours. Well, he's got an education. He'll get a job, but what about me? We started looking at other people. We started comparing ourselves, and we started looking at the negative instead of what's to come, the positive. Instead of the positive, the Christ is still the reigning king, and he's still in control. It might not look like it. It might not feel like it. But that is a basic reality that he is still king and he is still in control. And we focus on what doesn't change, the very character and nature of God. He doesn't change. And so we fix our eyes on who God is, not our circumstances. Because our circumstances will always betray us. But Jesus doesn't. And Elijah looks at his circumstances and he says, 
I'm horrible. I'm a horrible prophet. I'm not any good. I don't, I'm not going to succeed. You know, th- all this kind of mindsets that we need to run from, not run towards. And before, the fourth path that leads to depression is when you forget God. Uh, here we see it in verse 4. Pray that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. He just forgot that what God has done in his life. He forgot what God did. You know, the, be, moments before, when days before, when he saw the very glory and splendor of God show up in his life. The, one of the greatest miracles in, in the history, and he just forgot. How many times do we forget what God has done in our past? In, in, in our seasons of darkness, we forget what God has done in, in our seasons of light. We forget in our darkness and in, in our despair what he did when we were doing okay. When, when God spoke in, in clarity, we forget in confusion what he said. And so we, we shouldn't forget God. We shouldn't forget the miracles he's done in the past. You know, we should write those down. We should, we should somehow bring to account and talk with our friends and our family. Do you remember, especially during this season, we need to remind ourselves of the faithfulness of God to his people because he is faithful to his people. But yet we tend to forget yesterday's blessing amidst today's despair. So what does God do? Well, this is the response that God does amidst our uncertainty. Here's four things that are worth remembering. Go to verse 5. It says, But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him, told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Man, that's awesome. He wakes up, and there's the food. There's the grub right there by his side. So he ate and drank and lay down again. So he got some more rest. In verse 7, Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. Verse 8, So he got up and ate and drank, and the food he gave him uh, gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights, nights to Mount Sinai, which, by the way, is where Moses encountered the Lord, this is the mountain of God, verse 9. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. So this is what we see. Four, four things to remember, worth remembering. The first one is this. God says to eat and to rest. That's what he does with him. You know, eat and rest. Oftentimes what happens is when we feel depressed, far from eating, it's like we go to the extreme. We, we just don't feel like eating. We feel like, you know, just our appetite begins to wane, and we start feeling like, you know, I, I just don't, don't want to eat. We start getting gloomy. We stop getting rest because we're so worried. We, we stop sleeping. Our sleeping cycle is off. And so, and, and what God, God is saying is remember that when you are overwhelmed, it's, it's uncertain circumstances in your life, the importance of food and rest. Now, I'm not talking about food like when you start gorging, you know, you can start getting the bluebell. Thank you, bluebell, you know, because those satisfy, but they don't satisfy truly because our true satisfaction is found in God, right? So it's not that you're gorging yourself. It's not that you're getting the Dorito chips and now you're, you know, by, by the time all this is said and done, it's going to be, we're going to be so overweight. I mean, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about healthy eating, right, with, 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 with wisdom and prudence. We're eating, eating. But we're also sleeping. We're getting a nice sleep. We're not being consumed by the news. Sometimes, just sometimes, the most spiritual thing you can do is to eat, rest, and get spiritually fed. And right now, we're in that season, aren't we? Of eat, rest, spiritual food. And that's why connecting this way is important. That's why you connecting with the Word of God is important. That's why you, during this time, praying, fasting, pursuing the Lord is very, 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 very important. Because your greater food is not the food that you smell. The greater food is the food of the intimacy that we have with Jesus. Because He is our bread. He satisfies. And just like Jesus said, the Word was His bread, His food. We gotta, we gotta nurture our soul. We gotta feed our soul because for some of us, it's starving. 
It's starving. And because it's starving, we're, we're, we're pressed into a direction of depression instead of a, a, a going into victory and joy and peace. So we've got to feed our soul as well. Not disconnect from the Lord, but press into the Lord. And this mindset that we have that we tend to use as an excuse is, but I've got to do, fill in the blank, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, because if I don't, nobody will. And I want you to stop here for just a second because I want you to think about it this way. How arrogant is that mindset? To say, if I don't, nobody else will. And you might feel like, no, 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 but it's true. If I don't, nobody else will. And yes, that might be the case, but maybe, just maybe, your health is more important than that, than that thing, whatever the, the thing is. We have to consider that, that at the end of the day, God is God, and if things don't get done, that's okay. That's okay. It doesn't have to drive you into depression because after all, what matters is that you pursue Jesus right now. And if those things get done, great. The two things that we should be worried most about is love God with all, you, with all your mind, heart, and soul, and, and strength, and love the people around you. Number two, the, the, the second thing worth remembering is this. God replaces our lies with his truth. In verse 9 it says, There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altar, and killed every one of your prophets. That's going to be important. Killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. Really? We'll, we'll, we'll circle that, underline that, because I'm coming back to that. And now they are trying to kill me too. Now, his reality is so far removed from an actual, actual reality. See, he is believing a lie in that very moment. He doesn't even realize it until God corrects him. See, God replaces our lies with his truth. In verse 18, if you, if you go further down in the passage, it says, Yet I, this is God speaking, yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed them. There's 7,000 7, other people. You're not the only one. Listen, folks, you're not the only one experiencing the challenges, challenges that you're experiencing. I know it feels that way. I know it feels like, you know, I'm the only one that is experiencing this. No, you're not. We're all in this together as a community. We're all in this together as a nation, as a state. We're all, as a globe, we're all in this together. Your experience is not uncommon to mine and to other people's experience. That's why we need each other. And you need to allow God to remind you of that, of that very truth that you're not alone. You're not alone. I want you to do it again, this practice. I know for some of you, you might be annoyed, but I want you to look at your neighbor again, your, your, your son or daughter or your parents, and tell them now with a, with a confidence that you can muster, all the confidence you can muster, you're not alone. There you go. Now, now say it back to me. You're not alone. All right, all right. So we're not alone, and here we see that. You're not alone. We're in this together, folks. We're in this together. We've we, we got to press in with one another as well. Obadiah chapter 18, verse 4, write that down on your side of the notes. We see that 800, uh, I'm sorry, 100 prophets had been hidden from uh, the queen, Jezebel. See, we have to challenge that mindset and exchange our lies for God's truth. We've got to exchange it. We've got to allow God to put the spotlight of truth into our circumstances and, 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 and allow him to reveal what's the truth of the situation instead of allowing the media, instead of allowing you know, people around us in the hysteria and the paranoia to allow people, allow our circumstances to dictate what truth is because the truth is, and the truth bearer is Jesus. And if we allow him to speak into our lives, he will free us us from the lies and we will feel the freedom that comes from Jesus Christ the freedom that he gives and knowing the truth that God is with you and with me you got to exchange the fear of fill in the blank the fear of what do you fear right now you got to exchange that fear for God's goodness trusting God's goodness trusting God's character God, trusting God's promises you got to replace it you got to exchange it God has placed in you and me the seed of of joy, not despair, so let it sprout. Let it sprout. The third thing is this. God speaks in a still, small voice. 
Verse 11, it says, Go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him, And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, they, uh, wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle, what? Say it with me, what? Whisper, a whisper. Verse 13, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. It's a similar expression that Moses did. He covers himself. He's seeing the very glory of God. He knows that God is present right there and then. And when we are in the presence of a holy God, we, have, we, we just cover ourselves because we know that he is called holy. He is approachable, but he's also holy. And so he's experiencing the very holiness of God as he shakes the rocks, as he invades his circumstance, as the fire begins to brew, God is there. But he is in the whisper the whisper and we see that have you noticed that when when we are at our lowest god seems to speak at his softest have you noticed that when we are at, at, at our lowest god is speaking at his softest are you listening or is your life so busy with worry and anxiety that all you hear is the chaos around you because he is whispering. We should settle down enough to hear his gentle, loving, nurturing whisper to us. Number four, the fourth thing to remember is God gives us something to do. Something to do. Verse 15, it says, Then the Lord told him, Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. So you're going to go back to where you came from. When, when, you, when you arrive there, anoint Jezeel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nim, uh, Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha, son of Shaphat from the town of abel Mahola to replace you as my prophet. It says, you know, you're going to go back to do what prophets do. There's going to be a time that you're going to have to go back to do what you were doing. But, uh, but right now, is, is God's calling you to disciple the people around you. A prophet declares the word of God, which is scripture. You know, declared, the prophet would declare the word of God to his people. And for you, it's declaring the word of God in your household, with the people that you rub shoulders with, via thumb to thumb, text to text, or phone call. That's the way we get started. You have something to do. What you have to do is not only to know God, but to make him known. You see, our vision is still the same, that every man, woman, and child would have repeated opportunities to hear, see, and respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. Every man, woman, and child. And therefore, you are participants of that vision of making disciples. And so we start at home, and then at some point, we'll have that opportunity to engage back into culture, civilization, work environment, and do continue to do the things that we, God is calling us to do right now. To declare the wonders of God and to seek him once again. Declare his wonders. When depression paralyzes you, go to the next thing. Look to where God can use you now. When you feel like a, you just can't do anything, look to the next thing. What's the next thing you can do? I'm not talking about leaving, you know, especially if you're quarantined. I'm not saying leaving the house. What I'm saying is what's the next thing for you to do? Because that d doesn't just happen by face-to-face -face or contact-to-contact. -contact. That might happen like through social media and other, uh, other options. So how does the story end? How does the story end? Uh, go to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, verse 11. We'll see the, the end of the story. And it says, As they were walking along and talking suddenly, a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Now, I want you to pause here for just a second. Don't miss it, folks. Do not miss it. What was Elijah so scared of that that led him to depression? Remember what, was, what he was scared of? Death. That he would die. 
death under the hand of Queen Jezebel. And yet, ironically, he doesn't get to experience death. Doesn't experience that. Only two people in Scripture don't experience death. And he's one of them, Enoch being the other one. But he doesn't experience the very fear he had. And this is my point. Your what if, your fear, may never even come to pass. So instead of focusing on the what if this, what if that, what if this, trust on the goodness of God, the certainty of who God is, the very character and nature of of who God is, and the fact that He is faithful, He is kind, He is good. And those are the things that we focus on here right now. And when we do that, we begin to turn that corner and have victory over depression. Let's pray. Lord Father, we thank you so much that you are our God and that you are present here with us. Lord, for the person that is struggling right now with depression, I pray that you would lift that burden off that person and that you would infuse in him or her joy. The joy that only you can provide when we seek you. Lord, for the person that was thinking about taking their life, Lord, we pray that that, that you would remind that person that they are not alone. They are not alone. 